right. I um, many of you may, if you follow me on social media, you saw that I was somewhere. Where was I at? I was. I, I've been a lot of places the last couple of weeks. Um, I was in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago. Yes, any Philadelphia Philly folk? All right, come on, Philly. All right. I was in Philly because they had had a number of of uh, violent shootings. About 30 people had been killed, or um, at least shot, shot and killed. Combination. I don't want to put 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 uh, uh, a false description on 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 our city of brotherly love. But they had an extreme spike in violence. And uh, some loved ones were asking me to come. Uh, and I had already been in town for the reparations hearing. I think I've talked about that already. Uh, that was happening in DC that week. And so I caught a train to Philly and ended up staying there over the weekend to kind of build and hang out with some of our loved ones there. And uh, indeed, it, it, it's proven to be quite uh, a challenge where we have uh, lots and lots of neighborhoods that are being gentrified and displaced and and, 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 and <clears throat> groups that have historically for decades been rivals with one another are now being kind of pushed into the same neighborhoods without any efforts to uh, address the historical conflicts that have happened there. And that's just exacerbating a lot of tension. And so uh, I'm heading back there this week after I stopped through Chicago to, to meet with a number of churches to, to help uh, spread our I Am a Peacemaker initiative and, and uh, get more churches involved in helping to heal and bridge some of that hurt. And uh, then I came home for a few days and, and ended up having to go to Tampa, uh, uh, Florida, where it was hot. My God, today. I, I, I uh, was not ready. Lord, I was not ready for, for the heat. And you know, um, you know, th this convention is, is a, a summer convention for the Church of God in Christ, one of our historical black Pentecostal denominations that uh, have uh, really produced uh, one of our largest denominational expressions here in the United States uh, of Pentecostals. They have, uh, let me see, I believe 12,000 churches and six million members in the Church of God in Christ. And so every, uh, July, they meet in uh, a city across the country, and they have a 25 to 30,000 member uh, con convention where folks come from all across the country. And then every uh, November, uh, we meet usually either in, they used to meet in Memphis, because that's where the Church of God in Christ was founded. Now they meet in St. Louis, and that's uh, about a 50 or 60,000 member uh, convention. So you can just imagine all these black, old school black church folk walking around in suits, somebody say amen, and dresses and, and skirts, somebody say amen, and stockings, somebody say amen. <laughs> Old school, <laughs> somebody say amen. And it was hot, somebody say amen. I, I, my hotel was 0.3 miles from the convention center and I Ubered every single step, amen. I, I know that Uber man was looking at me like, bro, this three point, point. I said, listen man, I'm not built for this, amen. And, and, and I didn't have on no suit. I had on my polo shirt. It is still, I felt like I was going to just, just pass out. <laughs> but while we were there, we were able to do a number of trainings with some of the international uh, church members, leaders, particularly with young people. And I just want to tell you, uh, it was just such an amazing opportunity to, to hang out with the saints and their young folks. There were easily, I'd say, um, you know, three, 4,000 uh, uh, young people between the ages of, say, 12 and 30 that we just were able to do focused engagement with and, and, and train them on uh, how to address issues related to mass incarceration and gun violence. Uh, we even got a chance to talk a little bit about uh, their role and the need for the church to be activated in this season. And it was received so well that if you follow me on social media, you saw a post where we all put on these t-shirts these, uh, that said, I am a peacemaker. And we led, uh, I say thousands of them in uh, some chants that, that included a hands up, don't shoot in uh, remembrance of, of our loved ones in Ferguson. This is coming up to be the fifth year anniversary of the killing of Michael Brown and many of us were were there, uh, well, many of you know that our, our church, I, I'd say we had at least, I don't know, six or seven members from our church that were in Ferguson. Um, 
doing all kinds of various type things. I think of Eden Lean, and I think of Chris, and, and, and a number of other folks. Not, not that Chris. It was another Chris, because there's more than one Chris in the whole world. Somebody say amen. Uh, my, brain, my brain just be, I don't know why I need to say that, because I'm sure y'all understood that there's more than one Chris. But anyway, um, you know, five years later, it, 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 it proved to be a very amazing opportunity for the young people to get a chance to see and hear um, some more testimonies. Uh, I had, we had a family from Tampa, uh, um, the Hardy family, um, who, whose young son was lost to uh, vigilante violence in Tampa about five years ago as well. And so this, this reality uh, continues to, to, to persist. And, and this past week uh, is the anniversary of one of the most tragic, I think, in the last few years with uh, the third year anniversary of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile and, and, and I think Sandra Bland's anniversary is later this month. And so, so just being there with the, with the Church of God in Christ uh, community and, and being able to train and do all kinds of great things with them was a great blessing. And, and while we were there, Jonathan McReynolds and, and uh, Kenton Jones, who's a, a hip hop pioneer in, in the uh, gospel hip hop space, were all there and it was just a blessing to see um, the response. And, and so I just share all that to say because, um, you know, we take, may take a little bit for granted here at The Way that, uh, you know, our many, many more churches are naturally kind of leaning into this. But it was great to not only see the Church of God in Christ lean into it, the leadership there, Bishop Charles Blake, who's the presiding bishop, I went and met with him a couple weeks ago, and he was just so supportive of this effort of trying to make sure issues of justice and liberation are being much more uh, celebrated and, and positioned in the church. And then the, the youth president there, President Ben Stevens out of uh, Kansas City, and Chair Lady Joyce Rogers out of, uh, I think she's from Fort Worth, Texas. They all were just so excited. And, and so I just hope that uh, we continue to pray for our churches all across the country because this season is requiring the churches to do much more uh, to respond to these issues of gun violence, mass incarceration, uh, the issues of our immigrants at the border, all of these things. The church should be at the front line of changing these realities, not be in the background just bemoaning them. Amen? And, and, and I, I'm going to preach. Uh, t turn, turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Um, uh, but but part of part of why I, I felt it was so important to say this is because as we were talking with some of the young people, you know, I asked them, how many of you have been in church uh, for most of your life? And I say 90 percent of the young people raised their hand. And I asked them, how many of you uh, know someone who has been shot with a gun, someone who has shot someone with a gun, someone who has died by being shot uh, with a gun and the same amount of hands shot up in the air? Luke chapter 10, the same amount of hands shot in the air, which leads me to believe that being in church, as we know, does not keep us or our children from being proximal to this kind of violence. That trauma, amen, is, is a huge problem in our communities and the, the, the kind of healing that is necessary for us to uh, make sure we are producing young people and families that aren't overdetermined by trauma, it is a great task, I believe, for the house of God to lean into during this season. And so I hope that, you know, our ministry, as it's outward facing, we can always also keep imagining that it must be inward facing as well. Does that make sense? It can't just be ministering everywhere to the outside and then we ignore the work that has to happen on the inside. The inside of our churches, the inside of our families, the inside of ourselves. Amen, it's quiet up in here. But it's the truth anyhow. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them I gotta work on me too. Amen. And all of this work together, uh, I think is gonna help frame uh, the anniversary message that I hope to deliver today. Now. Uh, as you as you can imagine, uh, we we have a whole month of preaching where we're going to have guests coming from all across the country. So this will be the last time you hear me preach, uh, at least for the rest of the month. Some of you may be happy about that. Amen. And and you'll get a chance to hear some new voices uh, or some voices you've heard before. And then myself and Pastor Erna and the rest of our uh, Tanisha, and the rest of our ministry staff will be back preaching uh, during the month of August. But I hope that you uh, appreciate that these preachers coming in are gonna be a great blessing and I think you're gonna get a whole lot of good word from them. 
So I want you to make sure you're inviting friends and families to come for our anniversary month in the name of the Lord. We're going to Luke chapter 10. It should be on the screen as well. Uh, I am uh, going to continue a bit of a theme that we started last week where I talked about the Spirit made me do it. I want to spend today's sermon talking about how the Spirit made us do it and uh, talking about the journey of our church and, and how we have been called, hopefully, to be faithful to the ways of Jesus. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 1. Uh, this is our lectionary passage for the day, and, and uh, I, I, I love when a plan comes together, as uh, Hannibal Lecter, he says, not Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal from the A-team. Y'all pray, pray for me. My, my brain is not as sharp as it, it was when I started 14 years ago. And we can chalk that up to many things. But Hannibal from the A-team. And uh, some of y'all don't even know who that is, so I might as well stop talking about that too. All right. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 1. I believe this may be the message translation. Uh, so let's read along. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. The book of Luke, as we know, is one of the uh, uh, gospels written by uh, a physician by the name of Luke, who is thought to have gotten this directly from Paul, who was thought to have received his uh, kind of oral tradition directly from the disciples when he was in uh, Jerusalem after his conversion experience. And so Luke wrote not only the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And so Luke is one of these folks who is trying, as he says in first chapter, verse number one, trying to make the most excellent presentation of the gospel of Jesus. Luke is someone who is making sure that his gospel message has a universal lens to it. Luke is not trying to just talk to one group of folk. Luke is trying to say during his day, this message is for everybody. Somebody say everybody. And so I love uh, the book of Luke. I love the book of Acts because if you go to Acts chapter number 9, uh, the scripture first says that Saul, who became Paul, was one of these folks who were persecuting the followers of the way. And when I was in seminary, that's where I, I, I got the name The Way from. I was reading that and I was like, you know what? I, I like The Way. I think that The Way is a good name for the kind of church that I think God would have us to plant. And uh, some 14 years later, it looks like The Way was a good idea. Somebody say amen, right? So Luke chapter number 10, verse number one, the word of the Lord says, later the master, talking about Jesus, selected 70 and sent them ahead of him in pairs. Everybody say in pairs to every town, say every town, and place where Jesus intended to go. And Jesus gave them this charge. What a huge harvest, and how few the harvest hands. So on your knees, while you're praying, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands. On your way, but be careful, this is hazardous work. You're like lambs in a wolf pack. Travel light. Comb and toothbrush. <laughs> Amen. All right, so give your neighbor a high five and tell him, comb and a toothbrush too. Now let's, let's not forget to, amen. Of all the things Jesus told him to bring now, amen. All these fundamentalists, but <clears throat> all right, anyway. And no extra luggage. Think about that. I can preach a message on that all by myself, all by itself. Some of us got too much luggage, too much extra stuff. Maybe I should preach on that today. Forget what I was going to preach. Amen. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him lose your luggage. Amen. You, 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 you carrying around too much stuff. And it okay. Let, let me, let me, let me. Don't, don't loiter. Y'all know what loitering is, right? And make small talk with everyone you meet along the way. My goodness, now this, 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 this Jesus giving you you and I some good instructions. 
Because a lot of us got too much luggage. We loitering, we talking to the wrong people and they slowing us down. And some of us sure enough don't have our comb and toothbrush, amen. No, all right. Verse number five, and when you enter a home, greet the family by saying peace. And if your greeting is received, then it's a good place to stay. But if it's not received, take it back and get out. Man, that was, it's all kind of stuff in this, in this scripture. Amen. Don't impose yourself. Stay at one home, taking your meals there, for a worker deserves three square meals. Don't move from house to house looking for the best cook in town. All right? So, so Jesus is saying don't, don't take advantage of people's kindness. Can you imagine what it would look like if we had less manipulation by folk who claim to follow Jesus? Folk that just won't take your kindness for a weakness? Whether you a politician, whether you a pastor, whether you a small group leader, a worship leader, that we don't take people's kindness for a weakness, right? Verse number eight and nine. When you enter a town and are received, eat what they set before you. Heal anyone who is sick and tell them God's kingdom is right on your doorstep. Some good news. Verse 12. Now when you enter a town and are not received, go out in the street and say the only thing we got from you is the dirt on our feet. And we're giving it back. <laughs> Woo. I can preach on that too. Amen. Amen. I'm giving you back everything that did not help me. Amen. Mm -hmm. But I won't because we, we talked about something else today. Verse number 17. The 70, listen, they did all this and then they came back triumphant saying, Master Jesus, even the demons dance to your tomb. Jesus said, I know, I saw Satan fall like a bolt of lightning out of the sky. See what I've given you? Listen to this. Safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. No one can put a hand on you. All the same, the great triumph is not in your authority over evil, but in God's authority over you and presence with you. Not what you do for God, but what God does for you. That's the agenda for rejoicing. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So I'm, I'm going to speak from, from this topic, the, 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 the Spirit made us do it, and, and I'm going to try to just continue to contextualize a bit of, of our ministry journey and, and who we're called to be, what the Spirit has, has compelled us and, and, and asked us to be in this season, knowing that it is all a result of the Spirit, all right? And so pray with me as we ask God to bless the words and the thoughts and ideas of this sermon. Bless God, the word we have read. We pray that we will hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them the spirit made us do it. The spirit made us do it. Every year during the month of anniversary, I become quite nostalgic about our earliest beginnings. I remember uh, the first Sunday I was here, uh, you know, the church didn't look anything like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 2010, no, 15, we actually remodeled the church. And so some of you who've been here only since 2015, you may think the way looked like this the whole time. But the church used to face that way. And all the walls were white, and we had a nice old school altar stage that was elevated five feet up in the air, and I would speak down to everybody, amen. And 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 we still had good church, but I do remember my first Sunday. There were two people here. Well, actually, there were four people here. There was my dad, my mom, my late grandmother, and Sister Sandra. <laughs> and I remember I preached the first. My first sermon here was God will finish what God started. And I tell you, I preached, I just hollered and screamed, I, 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 I backflipped, I shook the mic, I was, because I, I, I just, I could see back then 
a, 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 a similarity of what I see today. That God will always outrun our plans. That, as a matter of fact, God is in your future already setting up things for you to catch up to. What do you think about that, right? Now, I know there's some folk who don't believe in God, you know, and, and, I, and folks still come to church for a lot of different reasons. You know, I want to be inspired. I want to, I want to like, you know, learn how to love people and do justice, but I don't want to take the God thing. I, I actually had a friend of mine who said, you know, she came on Easter. She said, Pastor Mike, I would love to be a, a member of your church. I would love to be a Christian, but it's just so ridiculous, these stories that I have to believe. I said, that's okay, you know, I mean, there are a lot of ridiculous things, I believe, and, and you know, like, America was, is just, like, you know, I, I, I believe that, that's quite ridiculous, amen, but we still participate in that, somebody say amen, right, that capitalism is, like, killing all of us, but we still participate in that, amen, amen, so, you know, I, people don't like to talk to me about certain things, because I always got a little bit of a, <laughs> just, just a little bit of a response, <laughs> but, but all that to say, that, that, you know, I remember the 14 years of ministry and the kind of church that I believe God was calling us to become back then. We're still in process. And you ought to say that to yourself, that I am still in process. That you are never a finished product. And as a matter of fact, whatever does not get finished while you are alive, I want to believe God will give you eternity to work it out too. Somebody say amen. Because some of us, amen, got a lot of trauma and challenge that we may not have asked for. And so don't put so much pressure on yourself to get yourself fixed. Just let God love on you. And God keep working on you until, somebody say until, until. and that's it. <laughs> God going to keep working on me until. When, you, when, when are you going to get better? Until. When are you going to stop being depressed? Until. God is going to keep working on us until God finishes. And so from the earliest days and weeks of our ministry to what we're becoming today, it has literally gone beyond what I had imagined, which causes me to wrestle continuously with this truth about our journey of faith in Jesus and our lifelong formation in the ways of Jesus. That, listen, while we may have little power to determine where we start in our journey of faith, we have much to do with how we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. When I was at Duke and I was being moved by the Spirit to kind of plant a church and, and, and I called my father who was, you know, one of the last members standing of our home church, this building where we had a church uninterrupted for at least 30, 40 years or so. And my dad said they were gonna close the church down. And when I got off the phone with my dad, I called my pastor and he was just like, don't come back here with me. Why don't you just take your church idea and do it there? And so I began to pray and I literally stayed up all night and I began to write this vision of church and the way came into my heart. And I began to talk about how the way as a description of the, 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 the ways of Jesus would introduce to us a incarnate way of life. The way Jesus came to the earth, listen, and took on flesh. The eternal, the divine, came to the earth and took on flesh. Inhabited that which was ordinary. And immediately turned it into extraordinary things. That the way of Jesus has the ability to inhabit our ordinary lives, our ordinary gifts, our ordinary journeys. And as the spirit inhabits us, it turns the ordinary into extraordinary. That I, I, just, I just began to see a, 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 a faceless sea of people who would be impacted by the way of Jesus. 
And, 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 and I realized as I was reading Acts chapter 9 where Saul was going on uh, his way to persecute followers of the way that potentially anyone who follows the ways of Jesus may attract persecution. And I kind of got a little shook up about that because, you know, none of us are trying to sign up for persecution. As a matter of fact, many of us are trying to avoid trouble at every turn. And that is why I think so many folk take a hard look at Christian faith and then be like, huh, I think I'll make up my own religion. <laughs> because this one be asking me to love my enemies and whatnot. And I, I kind of like not liking my enemies. It's easier, right? Uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton, uh, he's this, this, this author, he says it like this, that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting, it has been found difficult and left untried. And, 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 and I began to think about all the many ways that, particularly here in, in the American church, we can, pro, we can proclaim Christian ideals and then make a quick left or right turn and get away from those ideals when it creates struggle and persecution and dissonance and difficulty. That the way of Jesus is difficult, but it should not be a deterrent. For we who know that the way of Jesus brings us extraordinary power and life. What I want you and I to appreciate that for the last 14 years, I believe that we have all been leaning into the way of Jesus, the way of Jesus that has brushed us up against some, some ideas, some, some assumptions, some realities that we could ignore. But the way of Jesus just won't let you ignore it. Anybody ever been, been, been like, you know, compelled through prayer or preaching or a conversation with your small group person or just some fellowship and, and, and something gets brought up and, and you know that it's nothing but God kind of telling you that you have to go this way. And you're like, I don't want to go that way. Anybody, anybody? You know, it's God, I'd rather just kind of, you know, hmm, just, 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 just chill. I don't, I don't, you know, this, this, this too much. You know, I, I kind of, I kind of like being where I am. I don't like these folk. I don't like that thing. I don't like the kind of feelings or, or, or whatnot that, that this may create. And, and, and you still feel something pushing you to go beyond your capacity. Maybe it's just me, but, but I, I'm feeling pushed by God all the time to go beyond my capacity. That for we who would take up the cross and follow Jesus, we who would put our hands to the plow, those who would indeed be born again, the way of Jesus, though blessed it may be, in this world it is a way that seems to attract persecution. But I remember the Mighty Clouds of Joy, uh, it's an old school gospel group. Uh, they all used to wear like the same kind of clothes. They were like the Temptations, but they were just like would sing gospel songs from the South. And they sang a song one time and it said, must Jesus bear this cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, a cross for you and me. This cross, if you will, this burden, that we've been carrying, that we've been faithfully holding to these last 14 years has not been an individual affair. It has been one that has been deeply communal. It has been one where we have, you know, had certain folks sitting in the same seat you're sitting in 10 years ago or, or 12 years ago or six years ago, but at every point during our 14 years, someone has been sitting in these seats wrestling with what does it mean to follow the ways of Jesus faithfully. And as God has been faithful, so have we been faithful that through community we have literally seen God do miracles. Literally, signs and wonders. I remember some folks came into our church hooked on crack cocaine. 
And, and they didn't need a 12-step. They just went into the prayer room with my grandmother and my father. And, and, and an hour later, they had all the taste of crack. And their whole physical features, everything just changed. They were totally brand new. Likewise, I've seen folks who have had to go through a, a, a two-year recovery program. And when they came, uh, kept coming to church and, and were going through the process of healing, we saw a gradual change in their life. And, and they are decade, at least a decade, clean and sober from crack cocaine. We've seen folks stop shooting other people. We've seen folk come home from jails. We've seen families that are on the verge of breaking apart come back together. We've had folks who were sick to death with all kinds of cancer, and they were healed. We've seen people go through the hardest seasons and yet still stay committed to the way of Jesus. Why am I saying all this? Because I want you to know that as you sit in this seat today, you aren't the first one to not only sit in this seat, but to sit in this seat with some trial, with some trouble, with some questions, with some concerns that God for the last 14 years, at least I can be a witness, has been bringing people to our church and through the power of our collective faith and discipleship, we've seen God do what others said was impossible. This is the church we have been gifted to steward. And I want you to know that we're not doing it just because we don't have anything else better to do. Because I do. <laughs> Somebody say amen. <laughs> Lord, I, I, you know, there was a time I just wanted to be, be like, uh, you know, one of those monks who was married. Somebody say amen. And, 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 and could go sit on a rock and read a book and, and just, just look for Jesus in the rocks and in the, in the flowers. I didn't want to talk to none of y'all. But the Spirit made us do it. Somebody say amen, right? The Spirit made us continue to show up. Why? Because the spirit knows that if I isolate myself, if you isolate yourself, if we abandon the ways of Jesus that are deeply driven by community, then we will never become who God has intended us to be. We will become who we think we ought to be rather than who God wants us to be. And how many of you know if you are only driven by who you think you ought to be, you will always remain ordinary. Can you imagine that the God of history has a better idea of who you ought to be? <laughs> Man, you know, I be flying a lot. And when I get up in this, these planes, you know, I get there in the plane, and, and I'm sitting on the ground, and all I can see is the technicians outside making sure the plane don't act right, making sure the luggage is on the plane, filling up with gas, doing all kind of stuff. That's all I can see. I see another plane and another right next to me, the, the, the gate right next to me. I, I, I see maybe another plane, and then maybe I can see a little bit uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the landscape, but, but that's all I can see. But as I take off in this plane, and I fly and get to 10,000 feet, I was flying with my daughters. My daughters uh, went to, 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 to uh, Nashville to stay with my sister for three weeks. Well, thank you, Jesus. I, I, I just get happy thinking about it, amen. <laughs> no, <laughs> we missed our babies, amen. As soon as I walked in the door, they just ran and jumped on me and whatnot, and, and I just said, oh, I miss you too, kiddo, and it was a great reunion. <laughs> and so, they, they, we, we on the plane, and, and, and Nyla, you know, if you never hung around my daughter Nyla, she is like the, the poster child for kids say the darndest things. <laughs> because, you know, she says things and asks questions. You know, I had another adult tell me, your daughter intimidates me. <laughs> because she be asking questions that I don't be knowing the answer to. Like, well, why are you asking me that? Like, like, you know, she be asking questions like, why is your soul not well? And I'd be like, girl, go in your room and play with your dogs, asking me these questions. But we, we, 
We get up in the air and Nyla says, Daddy, can you open the, the window? Now, we left Nashville at 6.30 in the morning. My routine when I fly is to go to sleep. Like, I, I put my seatbelt on, go to sleep. My daughters feel like flying is an adventure. Many questions, many, you know, uh, uh, inquiries about why things work the way they do. I've never asked those questions. I just go to sleep. We sitting there and da daddy, can you open, open the, the, the window? I'm looking at her like, girl, it's 6.30 in the morning. Like, we, you know, we got, what's time? We, we're not doing that. But you know, it's hard for me to, to, to say no to the, to the kids when we do these kind of things sometimes. And so I opened the, I opened the thing and, and you know, she's like, wow, everything looks so close. And, and, and we just kept it, kept it up. And, and then as, as we got higher, she said, daddy, you know, the higher we go, the further we can see. And I looked at her, I said, girl, you got a word in your belly. I'm trying to tell you. Why is it that we think that we who are trapped on the ground of our lives, I'm talking about trapped, like anchored feet in cement, can see further into our future than God who literally is unbound? It is a point of fact that the ways of Jesus represent the unbound way of living. And of course, for many of us, it is countercultural, counterintuitive. It creates dissonance because we've been formed our whole life to respond to our, 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 our situations while we're in the middle of them, trapped on the ground. But the ways of Jesus are always inviting you and I through the power of the Spirit, to be set free. And this is what the way, I believe, is about. It's about us proclaiming this message of freedom, of formation, of salvation, in a way that sets you and I free. Free from the bound nature of our culture and our lives and our environments. It don't set you free to the point where you have no more responsibility to those spaces or places, but it invites you now to be different, a different kind of person. Rather than you just showing up in an ordinary way, now you can show up in an extraordinary way. Rather than just showing up as an ordinary parent, now you become an extraordinary parent. An ordinary partner, extraordinary partner. An ordinary teacher, extraordinary teacher. An ordinary justice fighter, an extraordinary justice fighter. With the power of God's spirit fueling you, that which you thought could not be done, you now have the capacity to do. And I don't know about you, but that's some good news. It's good news that I don't have to be limited all the time by my limited capacity. That through the power of God's spirit, I can see those things that are not as though they are. I can love folk who are unlovable. I can help folk who look far beyond my capacity to help. I can heal and I can, I can, I can, I can walk with people who, who in another life we would not be hanging out. Why? Because the Spirit makes us do it. What does the Spirit then make happen in this text? Well, Jesus ministering to uh, the, 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 the region where he's at, I believe, uh, you know, he's in the last kind of uh, weeks or months of his ministry, and Jesus has these disciples. Jesus got more folk than he know what to do with. So he says, you know what? Rather than all y'all hanging out with me, I'm going to send you out. And that's a good kind of word for some of us because we can think that our whole existence is only to be in this kind of radical individual relationship with Jesus. But Jesus tells the disciples, listen, I'm going to send you out ahead of me and you're going to pave the way for the work that will follow your witness. 
And that's the first thing that I want to submit to you today, that what does the Spirit make us do? The Spirit makes us become ambassadors and harvesters. That the scripture very plainly says that Jesus sends them out, 70 of them, two by two, ahead of him. Why? So when Jesus shows up, the way has already been prepared. And I want you to know that we have been strategically placed in this region and area with all the high rents. Somebody say amen. With all of the different kinds of cultural challenges and, and, and all the antis at work, anti-blackness, anti-poor, anti-indigenous, all the antis at work, God still says, I want you here. Why? Because there's a way that needs to be prepared that you are uniquely positioned and able to do. You are my ambassador, Jesus says. And I want you to know that you are my ambassador. Why? Because God wants to use you wherever you're situated to compel people to be reconciled to God. God wants you to be a pathway for people to find their way back to God. Second yeah, yeah. Corinthians, I think I have it up here, uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he says it like this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making God's appeal through us. We implore you. Somebody say implore. That means we beg you. Be reconciled to God. What would it look like if every person you come across, you saw yourself as an ambassador for God? Oh, but I don't know what to say. You don't got to say much. Just live the way of Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you don't need to learn anything. <laughs> Amen. Because I have found Christians uh, have the strongest claims with the least amount of knowledge. <laughs> you trying to figure out, how, how does that work? Amen. I have multiple degrees. I've studied all kinds of theological history and tradition. And what I have found is that the more you study the Christian faith, the less fundamentalist you become. Because you start to appreciate that our tradition, listen, is millennia old, unfolded over six or seven continents with billions of people Wrestling with the God of history. <laughs> Amen. There, 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 there's more ink written about Jesus than any other topic in the history of the world. I have not read all that ink. <laughs> so that means that everything I believe about Jesus, I believe it with faith, but I am not fundamentalist. I believe that our task is to show up with the enduring love of Jesus, a life characterized by love that that proclaims that when I show up I may not have the right doctrinal position I may not have the same theological expression but I have the same love the love that has stretched over millennia and people's groups the love that has overcome the racism and the imperialism of many of the folk who claim to follow this Jesus in history the love that has the ability to pierce the most stoniest heart the love that has the ability to draw many to God I show up with this love and this love makes me an ambassador for Jesus give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm a love ambassador that's what I am and it is the spirit that makes me love you. Because if it was not for the spirit, you can finish that sentence. Somebody say amen, right? But God is calling you and I to allow this spirit to have the kind of role where we can do not just ambassador work, but harvesting work. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out more workers. Could it be that as you rep Jesus, you're also out there harvesting? You're making an easy path for folk to come and join in this work. That the work of the way, the work of Christian faith, the work of the kingdom of God is not a work that can be done in isolation. You can't do it by yourself. 
You can't walk this journey by yourself. That in a world that has all these ways to connect us to one another, we have more people today experiencing loneliness and isolation than ever before. Our, 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 our imperial parent, if you will, Great Britain, England, has just started a ministry of loneliness at the government level. They hired and, and created a government posi position called the Ministry of Loneliness. They hired a government official from the public health department to respond to a crisis growing in a 66 million country, 66 million person country that lives in the geography map the size of, I think, Michigan. Think about this, 66 million people living in a size like Michigan and 11 million of the 66 million say that they suffer from chronic loneliness that produces depression, anxiety, and even suicide. What is it about the way we've shaped Western society where we can have technology and we can have all these forms of media and we still can't connect with one another in ways that bring life? We are ambassadors, but we're also harvesters. We're helping to bring people into relationship with God that brings about transformation and change. So the first question I want you to think about, when you think of where God has placed you are there harvest opportunities to represent Christ in new and more faithful ways. Think about where you're placed. Some of us are going through some certain trials, challenges in your family, on your job, at your school. Some of you are in a good season where you just kind of own like, you know, you're just on this pathway. Can you imagine that no matter where you are, you're still there repping Christ, and I'm not talking about wearing a Jesus t-shirt everywhere you go, although there's nothing wrong with that because I wear them, but the t-shirt should not be the extent of your representation. People ought to know you rep Christ without you even saying a word. They ought to be like, why are you so kind? They'd be like, oh no, it's Jesus in me, hey. No. You know, why are you so generous? Why are you so helpful? Why when you walk in the room, a different kind of wattage takes over the space? You ought not be like, well, you know, the energy, I have this energy, and you know, uh, no, 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 don't take credit for that which you did not create. We are ambassadors. Pat yourself on the chest, say, I am an ambassador. I am an ambassador, and wherever I am, as a CEO, as a teacher, no matter what my status is in life, I rep God. And I want people to know I rep God. Not by my language, you know, although some of us, you know, we can work on our language a little bit, amen, because, you know, be like, I didn't know Jesus talked like that. <laughs> He's like, I didn't either, praise God, unless he was talking to religious folk, which makes me think if you're going to cuss somebody out, you only ought to cuss out religious folk, amen. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Yeah, no, no, no. Pastor Mike just just got out of pocket. <laughs> All right, second thing, second thing, second thing, second thing. The, the text tells us, listen, that the Spirit makes us into overcomers and healers. Everybody say overcomers and healers. Say it again, overcomers and healers. Verse 17, it says, see what I've given you. Woo, I like this verse. Safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. Can you imagine how different you and I would live if we believed that every snake in your life Every scorpion, every vehicle meant for your harm, God has given you protection. Now, protection does not mean you don't feel it. Protection means it will not destroy you. Think about this, because there's a lot of things out here that are attempting to destroy us. 
I look at the policies of this wicked government that has been uninterrupted for hundreds of years. I mean, we, we, we had folk, you know, folk are turned up today, amen, because I remember growing up, everybody celebrated Independence Day, 4th of July. Now folk be on, on, on Facebook cussing about 4th of July, like, this ain't my day. My day was last month. I was like, well, all right, well, my day, you know, they start quoting Frederick Douglass, who said, what is the 4th of July to a slave? Amen. And, 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 and so Independence Day has not been very liberating for a lot of folk. Man, and still today when people are dying in cages at the border, how many know there's no Independence Day? When we have our loved ones at, in all kinds of, 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 of vulnerable populations across the spectrum, from, from, from uh, formerly incarcerated individuals to our, 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 our loved ones who are caught in poverty, to our loved ones who are caught in the, in the kind of anti-homo or in the homophobic spaces. We, we have all these different kinds of spaces where people are so vulnerable that there is no independence where the intersectional nature of oppression, if you are a person of color and a woman and you're poor and, and you go down the line, that all of these places create vulnerability where someone can be celebrating Independence Day and you're like, but why am I still bound? Why does my freedom uh, or why does your freedom have to you know, guarantee my bondage? that I hear God speaking to many of us and saying that even all of these realities, they will not destroy you. They will try. But you and I have been given power. Somebody say power. Power to walk on snakes and scorpions and still experience protection. If you're like me, the words sound so much better when I read them. But there are certain moments in my life where it feels like I am buckling under the weight of this oppression. The weight of my lived reality. The weight of, as I call it, the sin within, the sin around, and the sin beyond. How many know that when we talk about overcoming and we talk about being healed, that we can't just always talk about the systems and ignore ourselves? There's the sin within us. Paul says that we must die to our flesh daily, which means that, you know, <laughs> every day, the flesh you killed yesterday is like, I'm back. That's why those disciplines of our faith, if you're not praying every day, you're letting your flesh come back alive. If you're not reading God's word every day, you're letting the flesh come back alive. If you're not, not spending time in fellowship with God's people regularly, you're allowing the part of you that God is challenging us to, 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 to kill off. You're allowing it to stay alive. And I wonder, we're so easily susceptible to the wickedness in our world because there's a part of us that we're not attending to. I'm, I'm so active in the movement, been active for quite some time. I was active before there was a movement. Somebody say amen. Before it became, you know, vogue to be woke. Before folks start talking about white supremacy, before folks start talking about, you know, realizing that the, the way of American Christianity is death itself. You know, some of us was already figuring this thing out. But I have found that if you're so woke that you won't attend to your soul, you are a dead person walking. If you don't curb your ego, there are all kind of folk in our woke spaces that can't say I'm sorry to nobody. Can't get along with nobody. I'm like, I'm fighting for liberation. <laughs> Why are you putting so many people in bondage? Why are you trying to liberate folk? Because you're mean, because you can't. Think about all of these many ways that that is not a result of the system, that's a result of the sin within us. That God needs us to unleash the spirit so we can overcome it. Some of that is a result of the trauma within us. The trauma of our families, relationships, decisions, choices, things we didn't ask for, things we did ask for. All these 
things add up and create trauma. But guess what? The scripture tells us that I am your God that heals you. Which says that even though you may be traumatized, your trauma don't outrun or outlast God's healing. So I have a witness in here today that God has healed me. Better yet, God is healing me. Uh huh. And I'm still on a journey. I'm still, God is still working some things out. For the last 14 years, I can think of all the many ways that God has healed and God continues to heal. That God takes seriously the sin within me, the sin around me, and the sin beyond me. And the Spirit is compelling me and us to make sure that while we are overcoming, our testimonies are the ways in which we are helping others to heal. You don't have to have the nice formulas. You know, growing up, you know, you know, being around the saints, you had to have the right words. You know, you had to use the blood of Jesus, or you had to use in the name of Jesus, or you had to, you had to use these phrases, and then you had to shake your hand a certain kind of way and turn your voice a certain kind of way, and you had to start acting like you preaching out in the name of Jesus, Satan, come on. And you, just, and, 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 and you begin to think that the devil must know what you're talking about because I sure don't. <laughs> Like, I just, I just, I just, I just think something's getting ready to happen. And, and, you know, I'm not hating on that, but I know that when I've shared my journey of healing with somebody else, that all of a sudden I could see how that journey of overcoming and healing begins to heal other people. Don't you dare think that your story does not have the power to heal other people who are dealing with some of the same issues you're going through. Well, there is a moment in time where the church must begin to stand up and say, I used to be the one who had that struggle. I used to be the one who had that challenge. As a matter of fact, I am the one who is going through that struggle. But I believe that the same God that brought me out the last time uh, will bring me out again. Uh, and if God did it for me one time, uh, God will keep doing it over and over and over again. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Overcomers and healers, you see. And then the last thing, and then we're going to take communion. Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Somebody, somebody holler, my name is in heaven. Amen. God has written my name in eternity, which means that I am forever on God's team. God says that I am on your side, you are on my side, and you got a reason to rejoice. Somebody say, what has the Spirit made us do? The Spirit has made us be not a house of pity, but a house of praise. I will bless the Lord at all all times uh, things may not be going right uh, but that does not mean i don't have a reason to rejoice uh, things may not be what i want them to be uh, but that does not mean i don't have a reason uh, to rejoice uh, i may not know what god is up to uh, but i know that god is working uh, and i know that god is moving uh, and i know that the spirit is at work inside of me. Uh, I remember talking to a woman uh, who came by the way one day uh, and she said you know Pastor Mike I love being a part of your church uh, and I'm not one of these holy roller folk. Uh, I don't swing from the chandeliers naturally. Somebody say naturally. I don't do all that hollering and screaming. As a matter of fact, I don't even really know if I believe. But this one thing I do know, that there's something that happens to me when I come to the way.
way. I can't explain it. I don't know how to define it. But whatever it is, Lord, have mercy. It does something for me that I can't do for myself. I told her, you know, the Hawkins family wrote a song about 30 years ago that said the exact same thing. He said, what is this? Somebody holler, what is this? That I feel deep inside. What is this? Somebody say, what is this? That keeps setting my soul on fire. Whatever it is. Whatever it is, whatever it is, it won't let me hold my peace. Do I have a witness today that knows whatever it is that God is doing? I want to be a part of that. I want to stand. I want to experience. I want to do what God is up to. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, stand with me, stand with me. Whatever it is that God is doing, pat yourself on the chest and say, do it in me, God. Come on, say it again, do it in me, God. Do it in me, God. God, if you're saving, save me. If you're healing, heal me. If you're restoring, Restore me, whatever it is, God. May the Spirit keep pushing us to do it. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God, I pray for the hand that I'm touching today. This is what the Spirit has made us do. We hold one another with love and tenderness. We touch one another with expectation and belief, God, that you're not through with us yet. God, you have made us your ambassadors. You have made us your harvesters, and the harvest is ripe. People need to know who you are, but they don't need words. They need lives lived in love. God, people are looking for justice and hope and strength. But they don't need more rhetoric. God, they need a manifestation of your spirit. So God, I pray today that I'm touching the greatest manifestation of your spirit I'll touch today. Give them what they need. Squeeze their hand gently. Give them strength. Give them healing. Give them power to defeat the enemy as they walk on snakes and scorpions of their lives, experiences, people, traumas and pains, may they experience the protection you have promised. It may shake them, but it won't destroy them. It may touch them, but it won't cripple them. They can stand and go beyond their worst experiences oh Jesus and I pray we can have a spirit of rejoicing may we keep our joy in this season why because God you have given us eternity fellowship with you that God when you return God you're coming for a church without spot or wrinkle you're coming for a church whose names have been signed in heaven. God, sign us up. Somebody say, sign us up. Better yet, sign me up. Somebody say, sign me up. Lord God, let me be one of those names written in your eternal handbook. Don't forget about me, and may I never forget about you. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need your strength, I need salvation, I need peace, I need hope, I need power. You may be here today, and you want someone to touch and agree with you before we take communion. 
about you needing God. I want you to take a step out of your seat and let's pray here at the altar. Let's seek God. Let's ask God, Lord, give me the promises of your word today. I don't want scorpions and snakes having that kind of influence in my life. God, I want to be your ambassador. I want to be one of these people who are overcoming. Come and let's pray together and say, Lord, whatever.